Franz, can you hear me? Hi. Hi. How are you? Thanks. Uh, under the present circumstances, uh, fairly, fairly good. Yeah. <laughs> I would, of course, prefer to be in Zagreb, um, no, but regrettably, that's the it, it major is what glitch. It is, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Madden, you hear us well now? Is the loop, is the is the echo better? It, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. It was just in the beginning. Now, now it's, it's good. Okay. Dan, you hear? Yes, uh, I hear you. All okay. Fine here. Cool. Excellent. And um, Teodora is was here a second ago. Uh, I presume she is here or will be here in a minute again. Well, since we're trying to keep to the schedule and it's 11.47 already, uh, welcome back everyone. For those who uh, are rejoining us, reconvening and welcome to uh, the to people who have just uh, joined our little conference. Uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, we are now proceeding to panel two. So the first of um, the series of five panels that will be unlike the first one in English, uh, dealing with various uh, th topical, uh, thematical and chronological, uh, chronological uh, issues. Um, panel two will com be composed of four papers. Uh, Franz Filafer from Vienna, Martin Medved from well, uh, Brussels slash Vienna, uh, Teodora Shek Bernadic uh, from Zagreb and Dan Lukic uh, from uh, currently uh, Belgrade. So, without uh, much further ado, uh, Franz, the floor is your. Uh, the floor is yours. You have your fifteen. Or well, thank you. Evening. First of all, thank you so much for making this um, exciting event happen. Um, I'm going to speak about um, the topic Empire of Circulation, has put knowledge in its global settings, and try to offer some reflections of. Uh, on possible ways of uh, creating bridges between what I take um, you are trying to pursue in Zagreb and what we are trying to currently pursue in our Viennese project. So I'm very excited to um, establish a hopefully um, mutually beneficial dialogue um, that could be rather rewarding. Now, uh, let me begin by uh, saying something about um, the general conceptual issues that the talk of circulation and interaction raises. Uh, we all know that the historical profession nowadays is quite a buzz with these terms, uh, circulation, interaction, but that the promise and the perils of these uh, rather enticing terms remain ill-explored. Today I uh, will sound out the potential advantages of this strategy of inquiry for the Habsburg Empire, and I will do so in reliance on a set of research objectives we are currently uh, working on uh, in our Cultures of Knowledge group at the Austrian Academy of Sciences. I'm excited to uh, take part in this panel um, simply because uh, um, there are several colleagues whose work I greatly appreciate and have benefited uh, hugely from Theodora's work, obviously starting from her PhD on Kinski, which I devoured with great pleasure and, and benefit. Um, now, um, so what is the key conceptual purchase uh, offered by this perspective? It permits us to situate Habsburg Central Europe afresh in global history. And it does so in mutually beneficial ways because it promotes a better grasp of either of the Habsburg polity and of the history of the world. Circulation then, of course, is no neutral and self-propelling transport liquid that flows smoothly across obstacles. It's always entangled in structures of power whose gatekeepers can foster and curb, grant and begrudge access. Now, interaction is something that rarely ever occurs between equals. The knowledge is always deracinated and adjusted um, with its original subtexts being garbled, elided or suppressed. Circulation in itself then is nothing emancipatory. It is not the case that it's a blessing that makes those exposed to it live better lives. Think of the translators in the service of the Imperial Court Library of the 17th century, many of them Ottoman prisoners of war uh, or ransomed Christian slaves from the North African Barbary Corsairs who had acquired their skills 
in the languages of the Levant while being trafficked to the Mediterranean. Circulation also can be used to disenfranchise and subjugate. One prime example would be late Habsburg public law with the leverage it gave to state building nations and the deterritorializing of sovereignty later used by annexationist Nazi jurisprudence in the 1930s and 1940s um, would be another case in point. So circulation is no source of sweetness and light, but it can alert us to one important insight. There is no pristine, primeval and self-contained knowledge that is rooted in one place of origin only. Interaction is in the words of Kapil Raj, um, the chief site of knowledge production. So Raj's perspective is important because it effectively challenges the distinction between pure knowledge, which is pure at the source, and somehow impure once being adapted and translated elsewhere. I think the significance of this observation for the study of Central Europe is important because Central Europeans, as we all know, tend to deplore the kind of cobbled together makeshift nature of their intellectual traditions when compared to the allegedly ready-made pitch perfect Western intellectual traditions, uh, which is of course uh, um, uh, a deeply uh, distortive account. Now, uh, um, what Raj has in mind in his work on, on circulation is the aspect of synchronicity. So about uh, interactions among contemporaries that form a brokered world. Um, let us consider also the diachronic dimension of circulation and interaction, um, which is intimately tied to the construction and localization, so the indigenizing of intellectual traditions. Here I want to refer to a concept recently proposed by Martin Mulso, an eminent historian of ideas whose work has focused mainly on the Republic of Letters and clandestine manuscripts. Uh, and Mulso speaks about referential cascades across time to stress the pre-mediated nature of all concepts and also the productive misconstructions and miscalculations about the pedigrees of the ideas historical actors employed. So the ideas they had themselves about the historical roots uh, of their concepts. Now, Europeanness, which is a 20th century brainchild of common heritage producers that figures in both projects um, which co-host uh, and curate this event, uh, can be uh, productively historicized by exposing its implicit governing premises if we bear the concepts of Raj and Mulso in mind. And Habsburg Central Europe, I think, is a good launching pad for this sort of enterprise. The region in question can only be understood as a receptive and peripheral latecomer, clumsily uh, adopting what it received from a superior trailblazing West, if we rely on a rather impoverished sense of, Europe, of Europe, pivoting around the ostensibly rise of the West. So structured around the Protestant Reformation, as well as the French and Industrial Revolutions with its accredited thinkers, works of art, modes of social organization and technologies. By way of surreptitious advertising, I may add that I have myself tried to speak a bit about this geo-identity politics of the progressive West versus the uh, allegedly backward East uh, in my book about the Enlightenment and the Habsburg realms. Europeanness and the lack thereof acts as a chief obstacle to a kind of perspective uh, I find also rewarding. Um, so tempting as it may be to justify the study of Habsburg's lands in terms of its long winded Europeanizing, I think that it can serve as a springboard for a vastly more fascinating venture, namely the discovery of trajectories that cut across the grain of the rise of the West and allow us to reveal the myriad cross links uh, that tied um, the empire uh, to other continents and that subvert the ramparts of the fortress Europe. Thereby, our approach can provide a true contribution to unraveling the Habsburg monarchy, Europe, and the world. The empire does not merit attention as a self-sufficient specialism, I would propose, uh, that deserves to figure on the map of learning for reasons of exhaustiveness or of historiographical distributive justice, um, but um, it can actually reveal something um, about the global configuration itself. If we want to think about the Habsburg Empire uh, with its linguistic, religious and legal diversity as a switchboard and not as a container space in the vein of Cold War inflected area studies, 
This permits us to analyze the structure of the polity itself by revealing that brokers, go-betweens and mediators jostled on all its levels. If we think of uh, marriage patterns, of artisans' apprenticeship travels, of Jesuits teaching and missionary itineraries, or about the massive modern work migrations within the empire, and to thereby reveal previously hidden geographical dimensions and interregional historical processes that shape the empire and the different global settings at whose intersection the empire may be placed. So the first evident asset of the perspective on circulation, and this is an advantage any workable concept that historians of different stripes can use must possess. The first advantage is that our focus on circulation permits us to discover geographical constellations and historical processes we otherwise overlook. This brings us closer to a better appreciation of the empire because it permits us to dispel the baleful legacy of 19th century historicism, which artificially sliced the region into self-supporting national histories, each of whom possessed a clearly demarcated past of its own, um, whose main referential point again was Western Europe, either France or England, basically, um, and served as the prime legitimate context for its study. There are many such cross-links that await this rediscovery and allow us to relocate the monarchy in its global settings. One interesting aspect, and I can just restrict myself to this uh, one aspect today in the within the confines of this brief talk, would be a fresh reading of the Counter-Reformation in, um, in its full-fledged form. It made the central European Habsburg lands partake in what Serge Grusinski, the French historian Serge Grusinski, dubbed the first modernity, closely tied to the Iberian universal monarchy with its ramified Jesuit educational system that connected the vice royalty of Rio de la Plata to the colleges of the Capetian Basin. The intercontinental Jesuit legal literature of the 17th century with its reflections on peasants' bondage, the glebe ad scriptus state of the peasants allows for exciting comparisons within, with the multi-pronged Spanish monarchy, including an appropriation of Salamankian scholastics to castigate bondage in post-white mountain Bohemia. Of course, um, the bondage again being caused by circulation, namely by the exodus of non-Catholic smallholders. Um, while their rivals, uh, Bohemian Jesuits rivals on site, invoked the old Slavonic origins of serfdom, locating its roots in a putative primeval homeland of the Slavs on the shores of the Adriatic. So that's just one example of such what a histoire feuillete of this sort could reveal. Let me now briefly wrap up the first point and create a bridge to the second point I want to advance. The first point is the first benefit of devoting more attention to circulation is the capacity to discover what has been silenced and supplanted by historiographical self-seclusion, chiefly since the 19th century. It permits us to turn the Habsburg Empire inside out, so to speak. But I believe that there is a second, even more important benefit to be reaped. It consists in an exciting methodological payoff, as our perspective can also enable us to rethink some of the governing concepts of the humanities. If circulation is such a basic feature of knowledge production, why was it then glossed over by historiography for such a long time? If we survey the history of the humanities uh, in the last two and a half centuries, we can identify a sustained strategy of disentanglement that made science and scholarly culture the exclusive possession of the West, which then transferred them to emulative populations beyond the North Atlantic. This disentanglement had vast consequences, not only for the recognizability of large parts of human history, which it rendered illegible, but for the massive deaths of the humanities as such. Upon closer inspection, the strange continuity links imperialist and post-imperial paradigms. The agendas of both imperialist and post-imperial self-authentication depart from neatly confined autarkic cultures and encourage the study of their mutual perceptions, so of representations, which is of course a big buzzword in the humanities. We question the status of representations of the exotic other by exposing how these imageries are the result of previous encounters, so that they are also co-produced. Culturally encoded differences no longer appear as irremovable barriers, but can be read as products of prior interactive processes they occlude. Central Europe amplifies this point. Its toolkit 
was conditioned by the region's pluricultural situation, which required pragmatic first-hand encounters in a multilingual and multi-religious life world. Let me mention only two aspects that we are currently working on in our research group and which entail uh, an important recalibration or reparticularizing of assumptions about general tendencies of entire epochs, um, bringing central European material to enhance our understanding of how these epochal features are constructed. A significant number of Habsburg scholars encountered as neighbors and co-citizens those whom their British, French, and German counterparts chose to idolize or orientalize, namely Greeks and Ottomans. This led to a specific interaction-based variety of the reception of ancient Greece and to a form of Orientalism that cannot be conflated with Western European and German models. By historicizing the cultural techniques of representation, we can unearth the histories of interaction that conditioned them. The final methodological point I want to raise is the crucial role of imperial diversity and its cognitive management. So the capacity to mold the coexisting and overlapping life worlds in Central Europe with their respective languages and practices. Imperial diversity can be read as a hotbed of conceptual and practical innovation, as well as as one of the chief subjects these innovation, these innovative efforts grappled with. Salient examples for these sorts of cognitive diversity management would include Hans Kelsen's pure theory of law, Freud's psychoanalysis, Julius Hahn's pathbreaking world climate research recently studied by Deborah Cohen, Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich von Hayek's concept of a liberal economic world order, and the Vienna Circle's neo-positivist philosophy of science. All of these cases illuminate how the circulation of knowledge and the processing of diversity shaped the Habsburg Empire's knowledge order. We can finally move beyond the obsession with delay and backwardness vis-a-vis -a, -vis a pace setting best and introduce new equally important frames of reference to complement what we already know, such as the counter-reformational global South, India, Russia, or the Ottoman Empire. Now, to to conclude, I would say it was the capacity of the Central European epistemic portfolio to cope with imperial diversity that also made it susceptible to globalization itself. So it made it applicable to other comparable contexts and amenable to upscaling as a model of world order in the 20th century after the empire's demise. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for an excellently, excellently timed presentation, Franz. Uh, we move now to Mladen. Uh, in the very title of our conference, there is, a, there is an implicit nod to, to a concept that I believe Mladen will have something to say. Mladen, you here? Yeah. Can okay. you hear me all right? Yep. The floor is yours. Great. Um, I would like to share a presentation. Maybe it will be easier uh, to follow. Um, some of the points, just a second. Can you see the presentation? Yeah, uh, okay. So I think this ties in well uh, uh, with this uh, first talk. So as I put jottings, I also have a only 15 minutes, so it's gonna be jottings on this transition to capitalism in Hungary and Croatia, Slavonia. So I would like to begin by laying out uh, the framework uh, of an even and combined development uh, short briefly, and then discuss the differences between Hungary and Croatia in the transition to capitalism and more broadly, how we can uh, reimagine, rethink, and maybe better explain uh, this tectonic socioeconomic and political shifts in mid 19th century by applying uh, this framework. So this is a revival, obviously, of an old uh, politically strategic uh, term uh, from the early 20th century in international relations. And its main promise is that it overcomes uh, social and geopolitical modes of explanation, uh, meaning that within international relations, the units of the international systems simply fo follow the be behavioral patterns imposed on them by that system. Well, in social and sociological explanation, the international is me merely the expression of social relations. So in this uh, area, we try to, uh, the, an even and combined development tries to develop a more dialectical approach 
to rethinking the interaction between the system and its units, uh, very much relevant for, as I said, for the previous discussion. So in this perspective, the international becomes an interactive space of developmentally differentiated society, societies and the concept of unevenness, the first concept in the triplet of uneven and combined development is, a, is posited for societies throughout history. Of course, the mechanisms that generate unevenness differ from uh, one mode of production, one historical system to another. And therefore, if this is so, societies are always already international conditions. There are sometimes temporary, sometimes more stable crystallizations within this interactive space of developmentally differentiated societies. So if we have this unevenness on development transhistorically, uh, we of course have it in the, in the period of the transition from feudalism to capitalism. And there are a few basic mechanisms that the theory identify, which we can employ when analyzing concrete cases, just a few mechanisms. The key one, uh, important very for Trotsky's analysis of Russia was the whip of external necessity, meaning the geopolitical pressures that less developed societies are exposed in relation to more developed society societies. And this is also the geosocial pressures in terms of the very organization of societies within the system. Now, uh, given that the societies are on different levels of development within that system, they can import technological, organizational, uh, uh, and ideological uh, uh, innovations from more developed societies. But given that they are at a different stage of development, a different agency will probably introduce a certain into innovation into a different social environment. Uh, let's just imagine if let's say bourgeoisie introduced a certain innovation in uh, 18th century England, that same innovation cannot be introduced in the same way, manner in 18th century Hungary. But these societies interact and the innovation may be imported. In this sense, societies can activate under certain conditions the advantages of backwardness, meaning they may simply import all of these innovations within their own social environment and thus have this form of compressed development, the so-called skipping of stages in development. Conversely, there can be logically disadvantages of priority for societies who are at a higher level of development in the sense that they cannot easily adapt to new innovations given that they have a lesser incentive to do so. But crucially, when these innovations are introduced into a different social environment, into a different political organizations, it follows that they will likely generate contradictions of social amalgamation because the, the entire society cannot be emulated in its entirety, obviously. So hybrid, hybrid social formations, often unstable social formations will emerge within this interactive space. And their instability generated by a combination will of course then feed back into the international environment from which they borrowed all of these innovations, right? So if we apply this framework to the case, to the case of, uh, of uh, Austria, Austria, I mean, the Habsburg monarchy, but I will talk about the emergence of Austria-Hungary. I think it, it, can, it can answer uh, a major puzzle perhaps, and it can also explain a certain divergence between Hungary and Croatia. The puzzle from the perspective of political economy in the Habsburg monarchy is why in the first place there is an Austria-Hungary, why a relatively less developed society as a Hungary when compared to Austria and Bohemia was in the forefront of the transition to capitalism and the political reorganization of the monarchy in 1867. And this challenges a bit a certain strand, let's say, of world systems analysis inspired scholarship on the on Habsburg monarchy, for example, by Andrea Komlochi and Clemens Kaps, because Hungary was not supposed to uh, be in the forefront of this transition, nor form a relatively strong state structure within uh, the Habsburg monarchy. So how could we explain that? I think there are several ways in do of doing that. The first one is uh, clearly obviously to specify the social structure 
and then the geopolitical context. So what's the social structure? Of course, the specificity of the Hungarian social formation is the relatively high share of the gentry in the, in the social formation, comparable only to Poland where it was higher. And this gentry in this period uh, under discussion, middle early 19th century was undergoing social decline, right? In early historiography, it was talked about like it's Sekfu's three generations as a, that this was a, a stratum of entrepreneurial nobles, but it was actually undergoing social decline. Critically, it was relatively removed from the mode of production, meaning that it did not rely simply on having a t being t be having a relationship towards the land and extracting the surplus there, but it also relied on county offices. So it was relatively removed from the mode, mode of production uh, and relied on this local taxes, right? To a great extent, meaning state jobs. Within that structure of political organization, the county was also very autonomous, which, is, which was very import, important for its later political uh, mobilization. As one contemporary, contemporary put it at the time, and re referring back to the contradiction of social amalgamation, the county started to become an amalgamating furnace in, trans, in uh, adapting and modifying imports from the West, primarily in this period political ideological, right? But then given its relative autonomy, it became a mobilizing vehicle, right? For the political organization of the gentry. Now, this social decline, this political mobilization was mo this political mobilization was motivated by also a geopolitical context whereby the whip of external necessity was growing ever stronger. And this in the Hungarian context is clearly the Austrian and German industrialization. Uh, just a superficial glance at Kosciuszko's texts shows the obsession with this process and the uh, perception that in, if this development was to continue, if it was not arrested, Hungary would become a periphery in the capitalist world system, developmentally and politically. And this is the ideological message of Kosciuszko. That's why Listianism becomes important in Hungary in this context. It is less important to discuss the consistency of Listianism in the Hungarian context and so on and so forth. What is important to understand its uh, role as a tool of political mobilization within the Hungarian context. And also that it was modified to fit this context, primarily in the sense that the role of the state was much greater in cautious interpretation of how Hungarian catch-up would occur than in the original Liszt's argument. I mean, Liszt himself said that Listian is that his version of protectionism is unapplicable to Hungary, but that is irrelevant, right? This was the dividing line. And the gentry, therefore, with this Listian ideological tool, with this important ideological tool, wanted to create a stronger state for catch-up efforts uh, with Austria, while conservatives, mostly coming from the aristocracy, who were dependent on the Austrian market and who were more oriented to obviously to exports than the gentry articulated a more liberal in inverted commas political economy at the time where the imperial market play, played a big role. This of course then meant a very different politics in terms of the organization of the empire and the strengthening of Hungarian state structures, right? Uh, so in this context, we have therefore a, so a class in, so in decline, which is exposed to a growing geopolitical pressure, which then borrows mental tools, let's say from the West and from Central Europe to interpret this, its social decline as a crisis of entire society and find a way out of its social predicament in the transition of capitalism, whereby this class would become a state class managing catch-up efforts with Austria, relying on a more dynamic social, socioeconomic base that could generate revenues over time and counter geopolitical pressure from Austria. And this, and this explains also a major paradox that in 1848, the Hungarian gentry, a pre-capitalist class, a class with no relation to capitalist entrepreneurialism, was in the forefront of the revolution, almost a revolutionary vanguard of sorts. So this is the promise 
of UCD in this context and in the, in the transition to capitalism. But it also poses another problem. I have now stated that the social structure of Hungary and the geopolitical pressures that the gentry, that the Hungary was exposed to in the context of world time of, of a capitalist world system whereby the gentry could borrow and modify ideologies from other more developed social formations explains this endogenously driven transition to capitalism and eventually even the, the breakup of the Austrian Empire into this Austro-Hungarian political organization. But if you look at Croatia, you will say, well, Croatia also had a lot of gentry relative to uh, uh, total population, right? Why don't we notice a very similar react and also was exposed presumably to a very similar geopolitical context and it was in the same world time at the time. But in Croatia, there was no uh, endogenous dreams to transition to capitalism. There is nothing comparable to, Hung to the Hungarian liberals, right? There is no ideology of protectionism, plays no role, virtually no role. Sometimes you may hear some, somebody mentioning that somebody may have articulated something resembling, but there, it has no role at all. And although this is similar, the social structure is similar, there is also county autonomy and so on and so forth, Croatia was unable to initiate this transition simply because of the differences, uh, first of all, in the state formation. Hungary was a much larger territorial container. Then we had a greater promise, greater, greater chance of actually achieving uh, this uh, agenda. Croatia could not, right? And this then closed off all geopolitical possibilities that Hungary could have in this context. And I think this points us towards, on a more theoretical level, to the insufficiency of class based national methodologies explanations that were really dominant uh, in a lot of historiographies uh, in the regions. They, they seem, you cannot simply start by specifying the class structure, specifying the contra contradictions within the social formations, and then expect a certain outcome. What has to be brought in is this internationally conditioned development that always uh, kind of subverts uh, expectations, linear expectations of development, right? Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, one minute stops. One minute. Okay, that's then <laughs> leave it there. Anyway, therefore, I will leave it there. But I and starting from this structure, what I want to end with, we can then also maybe have a good starting point for explaining certain differences in the 50s and 60s as well, and a good basis for discussing the uh, a political economy of Austria-Hungary uh, as well. Anyway, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Martin, very much for your for your talk. That um, touched uh, in several ways um, direct effect, direct consequences to our uh, framework that we that we were thinking uh, through and about while we were pre preparing this um, this conference. We now move to Theodora's um, talk about the science of man in the Enlightenment Bohemia. Uh, Tadora, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, I would like to also share my screen because uh, I don't have a paper to read. I, I may talk about my point. Just a second. I think. Is this now? Can you see it? Yes. You, you can see, you can follow. Yeah. Okay. So I have my 15 minutes. Uh, actually, I must say that uh, I'm very happy to be here today. Although I'm talking from my apartment, I prefer to be, okay, not in Zagreb, uh, where you have earthquakes, but in Vienna or Prague or Budapest, that would be very nice in some Central European uh, surrounding. But okay, now uh, here we are. Uh, uh, I, I was really inspired by previous talks, and uh, especially with uh, Francis' talk. Uh, it's not about giving back the continent, but uh, it's really, uh, I felt like uh, that uh, in France are pointing to something that has been bothering me for more than, uh, no, it will, be, it will be more than uh, 15 years since I was a PhD student in Budapest, and uh, luckily, uh, 
my supervisor was uh, Laszlo Conte. And I may say that uh, I was coming from Croatia, I wanted to deal with the 18th century um, enlightenment, which actually didn't exist in the national framework, maybe in literature, in literature studies, literary studies, but uh, in historical studies, uh, it was not non existent. And I must say that um, I really benefited from uh, studying and my staying in Budapest and, and Vienna uh, because I could really uh, figure out, I could sense uh, what was the intellectual background of this region and what um, Central European University is fantastic at is that uh, it sends its students to Western Europe in order to broaden a methodological perspective and to get into touch with the Western European scientists and scholars. And 20 years ago, I was, I was really uh, completely shocked with the fact that uh, for Westerners, the Central European Enlightenment, Enlightenment in Bohemia, Enlightenment in Hungary, uh, is, is almost non existent. So, in the intellectual, in the sense of intellectual. Croatian uh, public about Kunsky, and now I have only five minutes. But I, I want to really thank you. You gave me some uh, inspiration to explain this to my colleagues. So, uh, what is uh, my methodology concern? So, uh, enlightenment usually, and I, I think that uh, 
scientists of uh, uh, history of historians of science, they usually connect enlightenment with uh, with science and Saturn and we have to know it and try to know. And okay, if we if we go uh, if we deal with perception, then it's very difficult to find uh, somebody like Kant in Croatian or in Hebrew's context. But we if we see enlightenment as a communication process and it really comes in separation, then we don't have the enlightenment as a set, set of ideas, but we have these certain practices, languages, and values which all interact and influence one another. And I want to point for, for younger uh, younger colleagues to, to the book, Negotiating Knowledge in Early Modern Empire. And this came to you. It was published uh, uh, five years ago, and I was, uh, I was at the beginning, I was a part of this, a member in this group, but because of family problems, and uh, I, I had to give up. But uh, it, it's really great to, to um, it's really important to uh, read the, at least the introduction to this book, which talks about the new history of science. So we don't talk about uh, models, sense of different model is completely different. We don't, we don't talk about peripheries, we don't talk about diffusions, we talk about contact zones. And this is very, very important concept because in contact zones, uh, people, so people uh, are, um, uh, they're independent, so uh, scientists, uh, all so, sorts of uh, um, merchants, uh, so this so intellectuals, they interact, they uh, negotiate with their knowledge, they reject one's knowledge, and when we have contact zones, then uh, we find uh, some urban urban enlightenment, like black enlightenment or Vienna enlightenment. Even now, when we have contact on diet enlightenment or, or Budapest. Buddha uh, or based enlightenment, then we have these uh, urban centers with their infrastructure, and we, we don't need this comparison with the West. So this is the so-called uh, decentered view, which I think it's very, very important and very, very appropriate for the methodology in any any uh, uh, state or country in Central Europe. So I have just a few minutes, so I have left. Um, so my in my dissertation, because since Kinski was coming from Prague, I studied Prague as a contact zone, and then I discovered different contexts. So, uh, of course, university, different societies, uh, Freemasonry, and even what is important, what is really important, both for Central Europe and for uh, for Croatian lands, especially the military frontier, is this uh, war. So the, the the time of war is uh, the time of really. Um, intensive circulation of knowledge because there is no censorship people are free to go and to communicate uh, I, I wrote recently a paper on uh, captives in the uh, Croatian captives in the seven years war who were uh, Russian uh, captives and in their uh, prison so they were especially uh, officers they were communicating so they were studying languages they they, they were writing books and so so this uh, of knowledge was really, really, really very intensive during the war time. And uh, of course, this Kinski, he was a member of one of such groups, and he was a member of Ignaz von Born group, who, who is a luminary, central European luminary, great organizer of uh, science. And uh, of course, this is a natural history uh, with the emphasis on natural history, so natural history of the world, both in ecology and biology. It's important, uh, really. This, uh, if we take, uh, if we put men, so men, a human being, in this uh, um, natural history framework, then we have anthropology, the natural history of men, and of course we have Francis Bacon, who is uh, the maybe the main model in the cognitive approach. Okay, I don't have. I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I wanted to. Okay, more uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. You actually have three more minutes at least, so um, yes, yes, I you do have some time. But I think that this uh, introduction, so this methodological introduction, introduction is more, more uh, important for this. Okay, Kinski was also a geologist, so we will we will hear uh, uh, Dan Lukic after this paper. So he was uh, in his free time. He was. Uh, uh, he had his duties. He was on duty, but he he was really prolific, very prolific in uh, in his observations about um, 
nature in Bohemia. And now I found another connection. He was during the World Campaign in 1788. He wrote to his wife wonderful, wonderful descriptions of the military border of the uh, Karlovac uh, generalcy, uh, with wonderful description not only of uh, natural wonders, but also of the people, which is uh, important for us. And, and what is really very interesting, so Kinski uh, and Born, and then we have uh, another connection in Dominic <laughs> Toma Basteri from Toma Basteri, who was a uh, uh, son in law of Ignaz von Born. So they are all mi mineralogists. So they are natural historians who, who were actually um, looking at nature, so at Earth as a uh, so, the age of Earth was judged by, by volcanoes. So volcanoes were, were actually a proof that uh, Earth is not, there's no water beneath uh, Earth, but, but uh, stones and rocks. And so they were looking for volcanoes everywhere in Dalmatia. And this became very, very famous around Central Europe because he found, uh, he not found, but identified as volcano one hill in northeast, north, uh, north western Bohemia, and this is this Pomerni Horka, and uh, he, he became famous. So this knowledge about the, the this volcano or volcano extinct volcano. So he he wrote uh, 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 so Ignaz von Born was like interviewing him about this volcano, and this uh, this writings were spread uh, in Italy, in Central Europe, in Germany, many in Switzerland. So it's also a member of uh, kind of uh, circulation of knowledge. And what was Kinsky really, really uh, famous about that he was, uh, and this is actually my, my topic, that he was famous about uh, for his mansion campness or the nose man. What, what I really find very exciting is that he wrote several uh, treatises on the education of young noblemen and on the education of, uh, of uh, uh, Young uh, of um, future military officers. But he, in all his writings, he's talking about the knowledge of man, the self knowledge, uh, man who, who knows about his passions, who knows about his desires. And uh, his main thesis is if you don't know yourself, how will you, how will you develop, how will you, um, uh, how will you persuade soldiers to fight for you? So, Psychology, psychological moment, the science of man. So it's not only outward that he's interested in cultures and, and people, anthropology of uh, uh, of nations in, in the head of army, but he's also interested in this psychology. So the science of man, the science of the human heart and the human nature, which was actually something that uh, I must say when I was in Scotland. So in Scotland, so this is uh, uh, one of, you know, let's say, uh, Scottish Enlightenment is uh, you you know it you you recognize it because everything is about the science of man. Science of man is like the invention of the Scottish Enlightenment. But when I was reading Kinski, so I, I could also see that uh, really it's this center periphery uh, distinction. So it, it points to it because we have we have a person who has his library, who has his uh, um, intellectual groups, intellectual interests, uh, who has his duties, his uh, is a state state figure, so he's uh, in the in the narrow circle of uh, Joseph II. He travels with Joseph II. His book was uh, actually rewritten for the education of young Francis II. And, and in all this, he he stayed very very modest. So at the end, uh, after uh, he died in 1805, he actually he, uh, he the only wish was to be buried among his um, among his uh, um, in other, in other so I was really, and I'm now preparing the next year. I'm preparing to, I'm rewriting my PhD thesis now. It's after 15 years, I think it's time to rewrite it, and I, I'm going to publish it. I really think, and I'm so glad that this, for this project in, in Vienna and for the last of one class endeavors, and uh, oh, really uh, that this has a Central European. Um, framework, so it, it became important, and I think it, it's very, very appropriate to stick with uh, uh, with this methodology that Franz uh, was talking about. Okay, so I, I'm sorry, uh, I, <laughs> I, 
was talking too much. And, uh, okay. No, thank you very much, Teodora. This was this was very interesting, and we are we're not uh, we're not very late uh, yeah. behind our schedule. So thanks, uh, Teodora, once again, and we move to the final presentation of our second panel. We move to Dana Lukic, who is going to talk about the ge uh, geological collections in the late 19th century Serbia. Uh, Dan, the floor is yours. Uh, if you do, you have a PowerPoint presentation? Uh, yeah, I have. Uh... Okay, then someone, wh whoever is in charge technologically over this, will uh, will let you share your screen in a minute. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, for coming to this uh, this presentation. Uh, after the, the the discussions about the circulation uh, of knowledge, uh, semi peripheries and peripheries, and 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 discussions about the the contact zones, I'm I'm hoping that I'm going to bring some some more empirical uh, how to say evidence uh, to these kind of theoretical discussions. Uh, I've seen that Kapil Raj is still very popular and uh, his, his influence uh, uh, has, has somehow uh, shaped this, uh, the, this panel to an extent. So uh, I, I was uh, seriously considering uh, th this notion of circulation of knowledge uh, when I started my work. And, and one of the things that, that I discovered was that not 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 all things were not as 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 as, as simple as as one supposed to, so I'm just going to start my presentation with uh, how in practice a uh, col uh, uh, geological collection uh, was or is uh, uh, established in one peripheral semi peripheral whatever we called it uh, place uh, generally. Uh, this was something that uh, I've researched as part of a wider research of the 19th century geology in Serbia. And uh, these are the like kind of like discoveries on how, uh, how geological collections were formulated during the 19th century and how essentially uh, some of the scientific practices were uh, established in Serbia, not transferred, trying to uh, have it a more circulatory form. So like instead of just the mere transfer, we're talking about some form of circulation in this particular case. So uh, when we talk about Serbia, like we're talking about some uh, an, an autonomous province of the Ottoman Empire that was not independent before 1878. And that was very strongly connected to the, the Austria-Hungary of the time uh, and uh, very intensively adopted various kinds of intellectual practices uh, from Western Europe, mostly through the Austrian-Hungarian uh, um, uh, connection. One of the reasons was a large population of Serbs that lived in, in Austria-Hungary that uh, over the course of uh, several decades in the 19th century uh, migrated to Serbia and became uh, form of an intellectual and administrative governors of the country and consequently influenced the transformation of the country based on the, how to say, knowledge and skills transferred uh, and then emulated and modified in the Serbian context. So um, uh, generally, uh, I'm just going to try to, to run through the context. Uh, uh, I, I believe that the audience is mostly familiar with it. Uh, uh, so generally, formation of the state administration required education. And, and from the 1830s and the 1840s, uh, the Serbian autonomous principality strive towards building some form of educational system, which uh, struggled for a long while, but eventually uh, start getting, uh, getting impetus and getting developed. And consequently, uh, the intellectual activities of the first couple of decades of the Serbian uh, principality was generally uh, con highly connected to the employment opportunities of intellectuals that whoever finishes uh, secondary schools would, was immediately hired in the state administration. And consequently, uh, the most of the focus was built on building state administration. 
And consequently, in so, and so now I'm, I'm bringing up the, the question of rock collection, something that was a considerably a, a Western practice. Why would anyone want to collect rocks in, in, in Serbia? Uh, what kind of specimens would they perceive they might need? Or why would anyone decide to collect rocks in Serbia? So one of the things that uh, the first one has to pay attention to is that uh, during these several uh, decades from 1830s until the uh, 1900s, uh, foreigners uh, were regularly traversing through Serbia, doing various kinds of surveys and investigations, either for their own purposes or they were hired by the Serbian uh, principality to do these kind of surveys. And uh, most of these first experts who conducted the surveys and who, how to say, collected the first specimens were foreigners. And uh, the first uh, person who conducted uh, this, uh, the, the, the survey was, uh, was Baron Sigismund Amadeus Wolfgang uh, von Herder. Uh, his, his name should sound familiar because he is the, the son of the Herder. Uh, and he conducted the first survey in 1835. And uh, I'm starting this just as to mention because uh, his survey was conducted based on the request of the Serbian Principality to discover possible um, uh, mineralogical, uh, potentially economically viable resources that could be exploited in the country. Uh, and uh, what is interesting is that he wrote a very detailed report that was ignored for a full decade. For a full decade, nobody read it. Uh, it was sitting, uh, uh, sitting in the drawer in, in an office somewhere in Belgrade, and nobody uh, was actually capable of reading and understanding what was written. And in 1845, this was finally translated, uh, but only the economic aspects, as economically viable uh, uh, resources identified by Herodot were translated, while everything else that was scientifically, geologically, uh, significant was kind of ignored. He was not the only one. A large number of Austrian Hungarian scholars passed through the country uh, several times and brought these spe uh, specimens to Vienna and Budapest. And consequently, uh, the knowledge about uh, Serbian earth sciences was accumulated and, 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 and stored in Vienna and Budapest and practically uh, anyone wanting to, uh, to conduct any research on, on, on Serbia had to rely on, on whatever was found and stored in Vienna and Budapest. And th these were the pr principal places where this information was stored. Um, so consequently, at the time between 1840s until the 1880s, practically there was not much interest in, in, in investigating scientifically uh, 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 Serbian territory. Uh, so, so consequently, uh, what, whatever was imported was uh, interesting from economic aspects. They wanted to discover mines uh, with ores, uh, uh, all kinds of metal uh, exploitation, or potentially coal, mineral waters, and salt. So this was the only thing that actually in, in administrative uh, documents comes up as, uh, uh, sh shows up as, 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 as an uh, uh, object of interest at the time. So, but it doesn't mean that, uh, that any of these collection practices didn't exist uh, before that. Uh, what can be discovered through the, to the notes is that there was uh, in 1830s uh, um, uh, an, an officially maintained collection of rocks established in a military hospital that was maintained by military physicians. Uh, but there are not, not too many details about this collection. Uh, what is known about this collection is that uh, at the moment when it was actually transferred to the Lyceum, Lyceum was at the time the, the highest educational institution uh, uh, that tried to emulate some of the Hungarian uh, educational institutions of that area that uh, in, in 1854, uh, after Josef Pancic, a Croatian uh, physician, uh, became the professor at the Lyceum, he was uh, supposed to teach natural history. Uh, he, uh, he was a, a botanist, uh, uh, 
and uh, he was highly interested in investigating the, the, the botanical aspects of Serbia, but uh, since he was hired as a natural history professor, he got in charge of the, uh, of the mineralogical and geological collection of that time, and he persuaded the Ministry of Education to transfer all, uh, all the existing collections to the Lyceum and Lyceum from 1854 became the center where all these uh, specimens were gathered and stored. So consequently in 1854, Josip Pantric persuades the, the Ministry of Education to transfer, uh, transfer uh, all the existing collections. And in, in the notes that remain uh, about these collections, we know that uh, that uh, whatever was in the military hospital was a considerable collection was transferred to the Lyceum. And at the same time, there is a note that there was a collection organized by the Ministry of Education themselves, uh, which is was of the unknown origin. There's not practically no details about it, but something was stored at the Ministry of Education that was transferred to, uh, to the Lyceum uh, at the same time. So what we know uh, at, from, from the remaining notes is that Josip Pantri tried to reorganize this collection. Uh, at the same time, what it remains also was that uh, Pantri tried to contact uh, the, the Department of Mining from the Ministry of Economy and try to persuade them to transfer uh, uh, whatever collections they have to the Lyceum and that, uh, that everything should be transferred to him and that he would be in a position to reorganize these things. However, uh, what is noticeable was that he did encounter a lot of difficulties because the um, uh, Department of Mining was not that interested in collaborating in the process. Finally, the uh, situation radically changes in 1880 with Jovan Jovic, who, uh, uh, who uh, practically uh, was the first trained geologist in, in, in Serbia, and he takes over this collection in 1880. And the knowledge that we have about this collection is actually from, were, were actually from his notes he, uh, he made when he took over uh, uh, the collection from Josip Pancic. Uh, what he noticed was that the collection was not systematically accounted, so that the inventories don't correspond to actual specimens. And he started to set up the new organization of the entire collection. And uh, in, I, I'm guessing that I don't have that much time, so I'll try to be as brief as possible. What was noticeable in this thing, uh, in this collection, was that the Serbian collection. Uh, that uh, he noticed. So items that were actually collected uh, in, from Serbia were the least numerous. The entire collection had around 4,000 items uh, and the Serbian collection had around 600. So consequently, it was considerably less in numbers and uh, that the foreign collection was much more developed and much richer because uh, the foreign collection depended on whatever was brought from abroad by, by passing travelers or Serbian students who studied uh, abroad. And uh, one thing that, uh, that I would like to point out as a case study was that in the early 1880s, there was a case when the Ministry of Education uh, started an initiative to establish a rock collection for teaching in the high schools. And uh, they initially uh, addressed the Department of Mining to provide the samples for, for teaching in, in schools, but the Department, uh, Department of Mining was refusing to cooperate. They ignored the requests for full two years and then redirected uh, the, uh, the Ministry of Education uh, to the Grand School Lyceum in the meantime, transformed into the Grand School. And they, they, uh, they, read, uh, they redirected the request to the Grand School and Jovich uh, who was the person who was supposed to uh, comply with the request. Uh, Jovic accepted the order and the request to high schools to start sending the specimens. However, the problem he faced with was again the same thing that was repeating since the 1840s that very small number of teachers replied. Most of them were not providing information about the location. So methodologically they didn't complied with the standards. The majority of specimens were useless because 
uh, the teachers did not know what to identify properly. Uh, and most of them, so they didn't reply. And when he pressured the Ministry of Education to actually pressure schools to respond, to actually do something about it, uh, because this was their own request, uh, the Ministry of Education forgot about it eventually and uh, the whole project entirely failed. However, uh, why am I bringing this was the consequence was that uh, the number of boxes did arrive and uh, uh, the, the shipment of the boxes was sent by either by the railway or the, uh, the local authorities, which in practice that meant police, who transported the boxes to Belgrade. And, and uh, this entire uh, process of shipping these kind of specimens uh, is significant because while the project in the 1880s failed, in the 1890s, if we look through, for example, uh, to, to look to Zhuevich, notes and uh, the co cooperation that he had, uh, these schools, the very same uh, teachers, professors who collaborated in this initial project were the most prolific collaborators and senders of specimens to him in the 1890s, for example. And one of the things that, that I would really like to stress was that the methods by which, for example, the shipments were transported either by the railways or through the local authorities actually helped Shurevich establish a network of people who would collaborate with them, with him and who would continue shipping specimens. And, and consequently, through these kind of already existing networks, uh, he managed to, to mobilize uh, a group of people who were willing to send specimens and they all practically functioned within the, the state networks, either professors at the schools, various teachers uh, distributed across the country, various local state clerks who um, can be, for example, identified as people who ship the specimens from various localities, uh, his own students. And uh, one of the, just to, to point out one very peculiar category, railway station managers, who somehow collected their own uh, specimens and started shipping them to Belgrade Fujovic's collection. Um, um, how much time do I have? Do I'm I... afraid you're out of time. So if you have uh, okay, that's, one that's or two concluding be, sentences, that would be okay, but we have to- Yeah, okay. On. So like finally, what was uh, what, what I would like to uh, just stress is that this uh, could be used as an example of how uh, in, in this kind of process of transformation of the, the intellectual uh, elites, how existing uh, political and social networks uh, could be exploited, uh, were exploited in the process of establishment of various scientific practices. I, I guess it should end here. Thank you very much, Dan, for a very interesting talk. And we have now concluded um, the presentational part of our panel too. Uh, should anyone have any questions, comments, uh, the floor is open. We have at least 25 minutes. Uh, we have 20 to 25 minutes uh, allotted for Q&A. Franz? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, all of you. It was very, very uh, edifying and, and enlightening. I have two remarks. Um, I would press you a bit more to speak a bit about what the, the, the concept of semi-periphery, what work it does in your elaboration of uh, economic and or intellectual um, transitions, because you, I mean, it's somehow emblazoned you now on the flagpole of the conference. So I was wondering about you could say a bit, a bit more about that. And the second thing I would um, say is I, I did not quite grasp in what sense the work of Dejan is a challenge to Kapil Raab's conceptualization of circulation. So I would be curious to, to learn more about that. Um, if you could probably elaborate a bit more on, about, the, about the corollaries regarding methods. And one last thing I would say, I mean, I found it extremely uh, um, enlightening what you said, Mladen, about this, about your slightly less theological approach to these developmental problems. Uh, I was reminded of uh, the thing when you mentioned the Hungarian um, magnates like Deshevi, for instance, taking part, uh, taking the part of free trade um, at the behest of the imperial chancellery, like Quebec, people like Quebec. It's a very interesting constellation. And I think this Hungarian constellation also should be compared to the Bohemian um, 
aristocratic voices at this time, and to the extreme resistance of the Bohemian Gewerbeverein, the Jednota, um, to um, Kubeks and Metternich's plans to join the German Solverein at this period. So I think it would be very important to, to connect your exciting insights into the um, Hungarian constellation to this uh, uh, Cisleitanian um, uh, um, trajectories at, at the time. So that's a very important uh, project for the future. I enjoy it very much. Thank you. So if I um, understood correctly, there are actually three questions, one for Dan, one from Laden, and one for the organizers of the conference. It's OK. Sure. Uh, let's give the uh, floor first to Dan and Laden, and then we'll um, uh, address the first question last. Uh, Laden, Dan, whoever wants to go first. I can, yeah, I can answer this uh, first question. Um, yeah, thanks for a for comment. Uh, well, I think the, the issue with the concept of semi-periphery, there is, uh, I think it can be employed in this concept, but there are issues with it. And uh, because it comes from this uh, world systems analysis framework, where it's, it's Wallerstein's invention, in a sense, uh, to have the concept of semi-periphery. And I think it can be employed in this context, but I, I have a, it's a ten, there's a tension there because I'm also challenging this framework a bit in, the, in, the, in this context. And it can be employed in the sense that for him, semi-peripheral states were states that were engaging in this catch-up efforts and high, had the high, highest chance of eventually potentially converging uh, uh, with core, most developed countries. And of course, the critical role in that process had the state, the state intervention in the organization of the economy and projection of power in international relations. And these states tended to articulate a more protectionist uh, uh, political economy when they were undergoing that process. That can, of course, uh, change uh, over time. But I think in this context, I think in the monarchy, and even going to combine development is uh, interesting because it subverts even this world systems analysis expectations. It tries to uh, uh, say that the relationship between politics, socioeconomics is much more complicated. And I think in the monarchy is a great case for that. Uh, as I said, because of Hungary, but also Bohemia, which did not have the appropriate state structures as we would expect from a kind of world systems uh, uh, analysis. So I think this kind of concept should be maybe uh, retaught or, or maybe more explicitly drawn out, what do we mean when we say the semi-periphery? In fact, uh, then it would be clearer what is being said here. But of course, I think w Wallerson could repose. Fortunately, uh, he's no longer with us uh, since last year. He could say that Hungary itself may be an example then of semi-peripheral development, meaning that perhaps it is, it could be employed there. But then he would have to show that Hungary had some complex economic uh, uh, activities going on because semi-periphery should be a combination of core and peripheral activities. And Hungary does not really fit that uh, uh, well, I think. And just throwing on, yeah, I think this comparative cases would be really useful in general, uh, uh, doing more of these uh, things. It's remarkable how little uh, uh, of that is being done, sort of methodological nationalism in a very integrated political economic space, a bit kind of situation. Uh, anyway, thanks a lot. Dan, your answer to Franz's comment, question, comment. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, when I said that it poses a challenge to Russia's uh, narrative, uh, generally, I didn't mean it, it disproves it. Uh, I, I really liked uh, Kapil Raj and everything he wrote. Uh, what, what kind of like I saw that there would be a kind of like a problem with this entire fitting about the notion of circulation of knowledge instead of, for example, a simple old fashioned transfer is uh, something that I didn't get the chance to mention was that there is a notion of a, an agenda of the scholars and investigated who uh, purposely the deliberately are aiming for transfers and their own personal goals and interests are directed towards emulation of whatever Western <laughs> practices uh, work on. Now, uh, like taking uh, like not taking this for granted as their own will is actually producing a transfer, but actually I do believe that this that can belong to a, uh, the notion of circulation of knowledge and that definitely this, th this can fit into this entire framework. But what I see as a challenge 
is that uh, like in my investigation, I dealt with the number of uh, uh, scientists who purposely fully and deliberately strive towards emulation and strive to, how to say, deliberately uh, obliterate any notion of local knowledge and who treated local knowledge with condescension and whenever they uh, strived in, in, in their own work, they really had a very strong emphasis on, on how to say, establishing a clear, uh, a clear methodology of collecting rocks where you go to the scene, you, you go to the lands, landscape, you identify methodologically what the landscape consists of, you collect the specimens, you bring them back to the center, you analyze them through your laboratory analysis. And consequently, they strive to, to fully follow the Western model. Uh, like I'm fully aware in the, this process, like there, there's always some kind of process of adaptation. adaptation and like once the, the specimens are sent, whatever in extra exchange, whether they're sent to Philadelphia, Vienna, Berlin or whatever, uh, that th this kind of like resonates in this, this process of, of, of circulation. However, what, what I was uh, constantly facing with is what was really not fitting was this kind of like intentional uh, desire to transfer the methodologies and to be on equal par and to be equal, for example, with scholars in Vienna. So like one, one thing is that like this kind of like uh, for the Serbian scholars, what I identified is one of the primary goals is to be part of the Western Europe, to be European, uh, like which something I'm guessing that in, in Raj's uh, models do not uh, uh, emerge that quite uh, uh, the same because in, in he's dealing with, with a different uh, 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 different culture, different background that, that uh, doesn't have these kind of like uh, pro pro European uh, ambitions. I, I'm guessing. So, like in in, in essence, I, I would say that it maybe poses a challenge, but I wouldn't say that it, it disproves because I still believe that his framework is very valid and and like and that it can be applied in in the in the Serbian context. Just like empirically, I have uh, that I, I found a lot of challenges for that framework on how to fit it in. Hmm. Just one, I, mean, I think it's interesting connection between Mladen's talk and your talk that this catch up modernizing imperative becomes an actor's category, right? Both for the Hungarian uh, economic actors and for the rock collectors in Serbia. So that should be actually um, a way of appreciating it as an actor's category, this catch up impulse in the, in the 19th century, which is also in itself very important and interesting as a topic to pursue. And maybe on, to answer the question on behalf of the organizers of the conference, uh, part of the answer. Um, so just to say, uh, Franz was the only one who exp who who um, who inquired about the Wallerstein in the nod to the to Wallerstein in the in the in the title of the conference, and the nod was there, the implicit nudge. Uh, to go into that direction, but it was never meant as, a, as an ontological obligation, of course. It, uh, part of my answer is, leans on, goes parallel to, to what, uh, to what Malin says. The other part, the larger part, from our perspective, at least, as historians, intellectual historians, historians of uh, scientific knowledge and science, um, um, draws uh, to uh, the STEP program, Science and Technology in European Peripherates, um, Articulated, articulated some 10, 15 years ago, which never really lived to its full potential, I think, but which addressed several very important issues pertaining how to deal with, let's say, national histories of science and knowledge, but not in a not per perpetuating nationalist um, nationalist uh, uh, narratives. So, how to address the fact that you do have scientific complexes and the production of ideas somewhere, but it in certain periods is on the same level, let's say it has caught up with the center, wherever the center is, uh, whereas 50 or 100 years later, it kind of um, uh, uh, disappears from an, from an imagined map uh, or intellectual map of Europe. And since we we're, we were dealing both of, um, especially our project at the Academy, partly also project at the Institute of History, we're dealing with slightly long, longer durée uh, processes. So how do, you, how do you put on the same 
chronological line and historical map, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the highly advanced uh, contributions of, let's say, Croatian scientists in uh, during the Renaissance and early modern period with a uh, relative lack, the absence of what we would call modern science uh, in the 19th century. And what do we do with, with this? With this chronological uh, chronological shift, and uh, we thought that uh, combination of the two of uh, thinking in terms of um, of uh, semi periphery and in uh, drawing left from lessons of step uh, might uh, might be might be a way forward. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? We we still do have time. Uh, I'm sure you have questions for 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 our. Uh, presenters, um, feel free to raise your hand virtually. There is an option uh, down there, three actions, or uh, turn on your camera and raise your ha hand so I can see it. No one? I, I, I've seen I've seen one and then it, it disappeared. Uh, Jan, hi Jan. Uh, hi. Go ahead, Jan. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I have actually a small question, and uh, I mean I I, <clears throat> I see now that the conference will be revolving a, a lot uh, around Kapilaraj and around Step, and probably we'll be trying to challenge them in many different ways. We'll see. Uh, or not, yeah, I'm just you know, assuming. Uh, I wanted actually to ask uh, Franz uh, if to, to, to which extent he sees uh, the, the ideas that he explained uh, and the approach he's proposing <clears throat> uh, valid for the like early modernity and how or is it like a kind of more or less a stable thing that he methodological approach that would work as such from the beginning of the 19th century until the end of the Habsburg Empire? Or uh, do you see other factors that should be added then, uh, let's say, uh, later on methodologically? Well, obviously, it's a, it's a matter of thank you so much, first of all. and, and um, Glad, glad to see you. Uh, it's uh, of course a matter of uh, of a calibration of different infrastructures you have to take into account, of course, no? and of um, different international players with which spawn very different roles that play uh, out different scientific persona, so to speak, and structures of persona in over the periods, of course. But I think that the that the general attempt to to um, approach. Uh, the, the history of the empire in this way of turning it inside out is a valid approach that can be followed from its inception to the 20th century. Of course, you would have um, to qualify the different conditions of production um, within this period that shift um, according to, to changing in, in international entanglements and changing international pulls and pushes. That's clear. But uh, what I wanted to, to do is primarily, and this is connected to the idea of uh, of um, pursuing this project also with the blog we want to set up in the next couple of months um, to solicit contributions uh, that are indebted uh, to, um, to this fresh take on the history of the region. Um, so it's no uh, procrustean grid which tries to squeeze people into these methodological, methodological guidelines, but it's more of an invitation for people to think with um, with these concepts and to, uh, it's, it, it should be, I think it's also the, the, the difficulty with circulation, it can very easily become uh, what this um, American historian Anderson called a move from, um, to, from optic to topic. So once it gets an op topic in itself, it gets reified. You know? the, there's a certain foreclosure effect involved in these turns, as we all know. So it can be a productive way of looking at uh, that material and at revealing process we have uh, hitherto overlooked, but it shouldn't become um, uh, something uh, pursued la polar, so to speak. That's, I think, important to bear in mind.
Thank you. Uh, anyone got any other questions? If not, uh, we are approaching the, the, the time that we were supposed to take our break. Um, just a second. I think I got frozen. Oh, here I am. Um, if there are no more questions, comments uh, uh, for, uh, for our presenters, I would like to thank them once again. And uh, we should be reconvening uh, at 2. Uh, so in some 45, 50 minutes. Again, please try to be a couple of minutes early uh, so that we could start in time. Um, enjoy your break, your lunch, and see you at 2 p.m. for panel three, in which we go slightly back chronologically uh, into, uh, into a slightly further history. Okay, uh, thank you. Oh, uh, a technical question for whoever is in charge. Should we uh, leave uh, leave the, 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 the meeting and then all rejoin or do we stay in simply turning off cameras and, and mics? Uh, we can uh, we can all leave and rejoin. Then it's not necessary that that computer okay. and, and the Great. Zoom is running all the okay. time. Okay, okay, thanks. See you soon. See you in a 45, yeah. <laughs> Bye.